Okay, guys, thanks for coming today. This is pretty exciting, really, for me to see this many people in one room talking Brian. Um, so I've been doing these seminars and lectures for about 10 years, and I mean, back in the early days, we'd get two or three people, you know, <laughs> and everybody pushed back and said, that shit didn't work, you know, and so we don't get any of that anymore, but so just want to lay a couple ground rules. One, I walk all around, so please don't be too distracted by that. Secondly, um, I believe the way we learn is interaction, not so much listening to a blowhard like me talk about stuff. So uh, if you have questions along the way, ask your questions. If um, nobody participates, then I'll start pointing people out because we've got to have participation. So... Uh, that's kind of the biggest ground rule. And then they've asked me to keep it to an hour, and I'm used to eight hours, so I'll talk really fast and go over a lot of stuff. So the main purpose for today's was I was asked, which is the most popular question I get is, how in the world do we charge our customers for this? So we're going to get to that. That's going to be probably kind of at the end, and it is an important thing, especially, I mean, for you contractors especially. But I think there's some ground foundational things that we should go over before we get there because unless you guys understand the value of what you got here, um, it doesn't do any good to talk about how to convert a customer. So uh, I'm used to a pointer and I look for my pointers this weekend. I couldn't find them anywhere. So I'm going to try this and see if I can move from slide to slide. So anybody have any questions before we get started? Okay, so just to give you a little of my back, did I go over more than one slide there? Uh, I just kind of put this together, so I'm not familiar with my steps here, but just, I want to kind of go over this so you guys know where I'm coming from. So uh, I started using liquids in 96, had my own company. Uh, every year that I had a company, we were in the top 100 companies in the country, and I started because a customer on a new property said you can't use salt. So I went out and bought straight magnesium chloride. Can you say huge mistake? It was a huge mistake. But it was no salt. It melts snow and ice, so I thought it was the right thing to do. So that's how I got started. Uh, as, as we went forward, we started using, I mean, my first sprayer I built would shoot 65 feet. And the reason was because from one parking block to the parking block across the drive lane at a Walmart was 65 feet, and I wanted to be covered all with one pass. And that worked great in the nighttime, but it didn't work very well in the middle of the day when the parking lot was full of cars. <laughs> so I went from that to gravity. You know, I thought, well, shoot, we can build gravity sprayers for 600 bucks. And so that's what we did. A huge mistake <laughs> again. And uh, then we went to a purpose-built machine that we ran on quad axle dump trucks, and it totally changed the game for me. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, let's see here. In 97, I started building a software for the snow industry because there was no good software for snow. That company is still out there today uh, called Tr Crew Tracker, if anybody's interested. Um, received a certified snow professional designation in uh, 2003. That was a pretty tough designation back then. About 10 out of 100 people passed it. In uh, 2004, I started a company called Snowfighters.us. And like I said, we were in the top 100 every year. Started out at number 16 the first year and got on the cover of the magazine because of that. Uh, was the president of Snow and Ice Management Association, if you all are familiar with that. If you're not, we have our 25th year anniversary in Milwaukee in June. You ought to come and it's a pretty fun time. Learn a lot about snow stuff. Uh, sold my companies, went to work for Douglas Dynamics in 2014. And in 2021, I joined Camion. So what I've been doing since 2014 is basically this. I uh, try to teach and envision people to the possibilities of liquids. I'm super excited about things that are happening like 
with SaltWise. Um, I'm a certified trainer for uh, New Hampshire for their certification program to be able to apply the icing materials and uh, have spent the last 10 years really, um, it, I don't know why, it's kind of become a passion for me. So if I get too nutty, you guys can just ship me off or something. So uh, we'll just enjoy a little video here and then get started. No sound. So, I don't know how far away this thing works. No, I don't want to do it again. Okay, Let's see if we can get on track here. So, you know, one of the first questions in, I really got to speed this up <laughs> to, to get you guys done in time. Uh, is what in the world is brine? As we all know, rock salt doesn't melt anything, right? Think of, think of your homemade ice cream. You just put rock salt around that little thing and you get nothing. You gotta add some water to it. That makes brine. That's what gets your ice cream cold. So brine then lowers the temperature, your freeze point. So, so I tend to, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. If we were in a four hour class, I would spend a lot more time with this. I think it's important for us to be on the same page as far as definitions, especially two or three very important ones. And so um, I'm going to ask this question. I expect some answers. What is eutectic temperature? Anybody except Kevin? What's you, uh, AMTR? <laughs> What's your tectic temperature? If you don't know, guess, guys. Nobody's going to look stupid here. Nobody knows the answer to a few of these questions. Lowest temperature? Not practical, the lowest temperature. Excellent. The lowest temperature at which a chemical will melt snow and ice, right? So um, I'll ask it here, even though I think there's a, another place in here for it. But. So for, magne for calcium chloride, what is the eutectic temperature? 60 below? Two. Right on, brother. Good job. How about magnesium chloride? We're just going to cover the three primary chemicals that we use. 35? 35? 30 below. You're pretty close. Pretty close. Anybody else want to take a stab? He said 30 below. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? 20. 20? Anybody else? 39 below zero. 38 below, I've seen it both, but 38 or 39 below zero. So now the most important question. What's the eutectic temperature of sodium chloride? 15. 15. 15 degrees. 18. 18. I'm gonna surprise you. Probably a, almost everybody in the room. Huh? Six degrees. Minus six degrees. So people who say to me, that stuff doesn't work when it gets down to 18 degrees, I hate to say it, but you're just wrong. <laughs> Here's the science, guys. It goes to minus six. You wanna hear an interesting fact? This is something I didn't know until two years ago, and somebody did this study, and it I, I, may have been Cargill, I don't remember, but it blew my mind. You take calcium, magnesium, and sodium, and you put them in a strip in a parking lot at minus four degree. We're always talking pavement temperatures, right? First of all, we're never, I mean, we're not melting something up here. We're melting something, and we're not melting, we're not talking ground temperature either, by the way. We're talking surface temperature. If the surface temperature is minus four degrees, and you put calcium, magnesium, and sodium down, 
in 24 hours, the calcium and the magnesium have both frozen and they're no, no longer working. The sodium chloride is melting still and melting more than both the calcium or the magnesium. I wasn't aware of that. Now, does that mean anything to us? Yes, but obviously we can't wait 24 hours in most cases to melt snow and ice. But the fact is, it works much colder than we think it does. Now, so that's your technic temperature. Can I? Yes. Okay. It's refrozen. But we're, we're not going to be using such a product. It, it might work. It actually works. It's still not going to be so slowly that it's not effective, right? For people who want results right. in less than 24 hours. You're, you're exactly right, which gets us to the next one, which is effective temperature. So uh, now, eutectic is science. Effective is art. And by that, what I mean is, it's an opinion. It's something that th it doesn't work the same time after time. The science part uh, that we we're just that she was just talking about is absolutely true. It's going to work the same way every time at specific temperatures. The art part of this is when is it effective? And I'm going to I'm going to pull the number out of the air that comes mostly from the Clear Roads study to say that. We're going to use today the temperature of 15 degrees, plus 15, as, a, as an effective temperature for sodium chloride. Anything below 15 degrees, I personally am going to want to blend something with it to make it faster. Above 15 degrees, you're not going to find anything that will melt more snow and ice effectively or efficiently as just plain sodium chloride. Now, some people blend all the time probably talk about that more as we go on. I'm totally against that, but doesn't mean you can't do it. It works, uh, but it can also create some problems. So anyway, that's effective temperature. So we're going to use 15 degree pavement temperatures as kind of the effective temperature for sodium chloride. Endothermic, who knows what that is? Anybody? The reaction that brings heat into... Exactly. So, yeah, so it brings heat in. Um, two of the three main chemicals we'll use are exothermic, or endo, excuse me. One of them is endothermic, two of them are exothermic, and we're going to get to exothermic in a minute. So if you were going to say what sodium chloride is, would you say it's endothermic or exothermic? If endothermic brings heat in, exothermic pushes heat out, which one is salt? Salt is actually endothermic. You guys know that if you put salt on blacktop, you have brine much quicker than if you put it on a shady side of a building with concrete, right? And it's all because salt needs that uh, sunshine. It needs that black surface. It needs something to cause heat to cause it to break into, turn into brine. So exothermic then is both calcium and magnesium. They produce heat. I don't know if any of you have ever taken solid calcium and turned it into liquid. Anybody ever done that? You can generate a dangerous amount of heat by doing that. I mean, to the point of melting down equipment. So they, it, Magnesium and especially calcium produce a lot of heat in the transformation from solid to liquid. And they do burn up quicker because they use that and they melt that snow and ice very quickly. Hydroscopic. I had two major failures using liquids. Both of them because of this word. Anybody want to tell me what hydroscopic means? Attracts water. Pardon me? Attracts water. Yes, attracts water. <clears throat> so I was using in the beginning mag chloride. I just shared that with you. 
Mag chloride is terrible. How many of you ever opened a bag of ice milk? And, or, yeah, of course, you never did that. It was always your cruise, right? Opened a bag of ice milk, left it open, left it sitting out. It didn't rain on it or anything. But what was that bag of ice milk like the next day? A solid rock, right? And how did it get that way? The humidity in the air. Why do you think we use mag chloride or calcium chloride for dust control? Draws moisture out of the air. There may be some other reasons I don't know about, but I know it does that. So what do you think it does in the winter when you put it down on the road? It draws moisture out of the air. So the biggest difference from my perspective, just as one who's done it, is that when I put salt brine down, it dries. When you put mag chloride down, it never dries. So the second major failure I had is when I put uh, a mag blended product down, the storm didn't come in, the temperature went up, and I had car accidents, people slip fall, and it was a parking lot for two seven-story office buildings. They had, re they had to redo the floor floors in both buildings because of all the product that was drawn into the building and it was purely because mag chloride didn't dry salt brine does anybody want to argue with that you're welcome to <laughs> as long as you don't make me look like an idiot if you do i'll, I'll guarantee i can make you look pretty stupid but I don't mind pushback, so you guys, if you don't agree with me, I don't mind you saying you don't agree. There's a lot of room for opinion here. Um, okay, here's one I want to spend just a little bit of time with, and I've made it my goal to change terminology in the industry. I'm not a big enough guy to do that, but I've made it my goal. Anti-icing. Somebody tell me what anti-icing is. Speak up so everybody can hear you. Pre-treating roads and lots. Pre-treating roads and lots. Anybody else want to add to that, or do you all pretty much agree with that? Okay, I agree with you, but I'm going to broaden it out a little bit. I believe anti-icing means not letting ice form. So we've always viewed anti-icing as something you do before a storm. What I'm going to suggest is anti-icing is not the timing. <laughs> it's the, it's what we're trying to accomplish. So you can anti-ice during a storm or after a storm. Let that soak in just a little bit. We always have called what you do during and after de-icing. My goal in snow is to never let ice form. Now, I know that that's not always possible. I was in... Um, Erie, Pennsylvania, and the guy was laughing at me and said, well, we can't use liquids, and I said, why? And uh, he said, because we get up to six inches of snow an hour, and you can't stay ahead of it. Fair enough. I bet I could still do it, but I, it's fair enough. So in that case, you're going to have to de-ice. If you have to de-ice, you don't do de-icing with liquid. Can it be done? Yes. It's a little bit tricky. So if you have hard pack, can you de-ice? If you have hard pack and it's not too thick and you have the right sprayers, like my Camion will do this, it'll give you enough pressure to penetrate some hard pack. Then you got no problems. But unfortunately, once you've got ice, you don't want to put liquid on top of the ice where it just stays on top and melts from the top down because if it refreezes, you've got a skating rink. Right? which I never ever had that happen. By the way, some people are scared of it. Could happen, I've never had it happen. I have, like I said, put down mag chloride and had to get very, very slick because of the humidity and the fact that it didn't get cold enough. And it, by slick, it was more like a slime. It was very slimy, but still very slick. Um, so, Anti-icing is the goal, in my opinion, for snow removal. I want to never have to get rid of ice. I want to always um, take care of it so that I don't get ice. Does that make sense? 
So you can do it before, during, or after the event. And you guys in public works especially do a lot of uh, anti-icing as you're plowing because you're plowing one direction, so you're not going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's pretty easy to put something down as you go. And if you do that with liquid, it works just as well. It work, in, in many ways, it'll work better because it's instant. You just don't have as much active ingredient down. Um, after the storm, same way. Honestly, in parking lots and stuff, guys, if you're if you're pre-treating with a liquid, a lot of times anymore, you scrape that off, you won't even have to do anything. Sometimes you will, but the good thing about using the liquid is when you scrape off the snow, you're not scraping up off the salt kernels and pushing them off into the turf. It doesn't come up with the snow. It stays there in the pavement and waits for the next snowstorm. So you usually have a residual still in the snow. De-icing, we, we've kind of gone over that. Uh, DLA, how many of you are doing DLA, direct liquid applications? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. So it looks like about six or seven of you are. I, I will tell you guys this, that is the game changer right there. I mean, I congratulate any of you who are doing uh, pre-wedding. That's a really good start. I know by pre-wedding, I, I cut my application rate by 50%, but DLA is the game changer. When you start putting direct liquid, liquid applications down with sprayers, it changes everything. And you know, I heard somebody earlier saying 70% reduction in salt. That's not uncommon. It's really not that uncommon. Um, we started out by pre-treating our stockpiles, and so you know you're you're pre-treating or pre-wetting. There is a difference in the two; they both accomplish a, a purpose, though. And if you do both of those, then you really are helping yourself. So uh, these terms here, I'm not going to go into a couple of these. Most of us know what these things are. One thing I will mention, I don't know if SaltWise will agree with me here because they, you know, they deal a lot with application rates, but um, I have found that guys that are doing things by the lane mile and guys doing things by the acre are using approximately the same amount of materials, even though there's a pretty big difference in the square footage. Most of the guys you doing lane miles, let's say you're doing 30 gallons per lane mile, the guys in that area are usually doing about 30 gallons per acre. There's 50% more square footage in a lane mile than there is in an acre, but because of the different types of application, it seems to be giving you about the same results. So I know in some of the uh, calculations, some of them are doing they're trying to do it all by the square foot, and I don't think that calculates necessarily well. And then the pavement condition is a big factor in, in that rate as well. It, it is. Pavement conditions. So, for example, and I don't think I have all these slides in here. I can't remember what I put in here. Um, shade. If you're doing parking lots, you got buildings. The north side of that building is not going to take – it's going to need more than the south side is going to need. If you're doing asphalt versus concrete, different application rates. So I kind of like to take an average of what it might be, or if you're using a GPS controller, you might have to uh, hit it a couple times if you need a higher application rate, but that's, you're absolutely right. And I'm talking about the actual, like, how it pitted out, or yeah. what the actual physical condition is. Of the, the, dry, of the pavement, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true too. So to give you a kind of a, a picture of what we were talking about earlier, uh, one teaspoon of salt permanently pollutes five gallons of water. Ten cubic yards of salt pollutes eight million gallons of water. And when I took these numbers uh, back in 2014, we were using about 19 million tons of salt. 
So you can imagine how much water we're polluting. Um, I'm personally one who doesn't care. I don't mind drinking salt, saltish water, but I can tell you the fish don't like it. The plant life at the bottom of the lake and the rivers don't like it. And so uh, here's the interesting thing about brine or salt water is it doesn't go away. It stays there forever and ever, amen, right? So it, here's something that just hit me that goes along with what we were talking about this morning. So California, I was talking with California about desalinization plant out in San Francisco. And they're talking about, you know, they take this ocean water and turn it into drinking water. And so now they got all this brine. They don't know what to do with it. And uh, we talked about, well, why don't we try putting it on the roads? It's not the right salinity, so it has to be adjusted. Still haven't gotten it figured out because transportation costs to get it to the mountains is more than brine costs if you buy salt and redo it. So we haven't gotten a solution there. But anyway, it's a good conversation to have, right? I mean, how, how do we get brine in different ways? Your cheese brine here, great idea. You know, just my, my only encouragement is you got to make sure it's 23.3% brine. Don't put down brine that's 26 or 27%. Um, I'd much rather see you put down 19% than 26%. But anyway, so uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, kind of. I'm not sure if I can. Look, I think I have a slide that'll help explain it. If if uh, if I don't, ask me that again, would you? I think I do. So you know, different parts of the country are really um, Lake George, New York. Uh, been up there several times with them. And you got this massive lake that's huge for the New York City crowd to come up to. And it's on the tipping point of going too far into salt where the, it'll kill the fish in the lake. And when it does that, they'll lose their whole industry. So here you guys have the Great Lakes. You have the drinking water issues. I was just with somebody, I think it was here, that was telling me about a town around here that has three wells and they had to close one of those three wells because of salt. Well, you take 33% of the water away from that city and you got a major issue, right? So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the environmental side of this um, because she covered it so well this morning. But I will, I will tell you this, guys. There are three reasons, I believe, after 10 years of doing this, three reasons that you should all be using brine. Now, it's going to be ordered in a little bit different order depending on whether you're public works or you're a contractor. If you're public works, I'm going to suggest the most important reason for you to be using brine is safety. It's instant. You're not waiting for salt to turn to brine. You're putting down an instant anti-icing product. As soon as moisture hits it, it's working. Secondly, I'm going to tell you that it's environmental. Uh, you're being way more environmentally responsible by using brine than you are rock salt. And thirdly, is your budget. You're going to save a boatload of money. Um, Jefferson County, I was out with them a while back with Kevin. We were there. And um, he has documented savings of 65% of his overall winter costs. <coughs> That would be equipment, maintenance, material, and labor by using liquids. So, I mean, he's a huge example to me of what people could be doing around the country because you guys don't have really warm temperatures up here. You get into the colder stuff. And he's not using granular. He's using liquid. So that'd be the third. Now, from the contractor's perspective, I'm going to say the biggest reason you guys are going to use brine or should be is profit. Sounds kind of selfish, doesn't it? But the truth is, if you don't make money, you can't keep your business open. This is a way to get a lot of the money back that we've lost in the industry in the last 10 years. Second reason is going to be safety. And your third reason is going to be environment. Now, I'm not saying those are necessarily the importance of those, but to you as a business owner, I think that's going to nail it. So, um, 
How did I get off on that? Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but we got the same issues. New Hampshire is a big, big. Uh, I would say New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Minnesota are the three biggest as far as really concentrating on this issue. Uh, and I've spent quite a bit of time in New Hampshire. What they've discovered, or what they say, is that about 50% of the blame lies on the contractor, and about 50% lands on the public works, but 100% lands on our industry. So in Massachusetts, I was there, maybe it was this winter, I can't remember exactly when I was driving around Boston, and you see signs that say, no anti or de-icing zone. They're not putting anything on the roads because the runoff is so polluted that until they get it to a certain level, they can't apply a de-icing. And so, you, you know, you get these people that say, well, God, why do we put all that stuff down? We didn't do that when I was a kid. Well, you didn't have a city with 50 million people driving cars either and feeling like that they had the right to drive 60, 70, 80 miles an hour all the time, right? I mean, I know you public works guys see that. I mean, I'm one, I don't really slow down much. I try to be a little bit responsible about that. But, I mean, that's why we're using this stuff it's to try, try. So in other words, I don't think there'll ever come a day, as long as we have cars, where we can get away from putting down some form of salt because it's the most, the least expensive way to get the road tr uh, treated. doesn't like that. Just one quick one on, on the Ontario River, tested it, uh, 20,000 milligrams for chloride during peak winter months. Chlorides on level above 800 are harmful to most freshwater aquatics. So we covered all that this morning. I'm not going to take any more time with it than that. But. So here's the mantra. Whoops. Sorry, I don't have my clicker. Mission, our mission as snow fighters is to use as much salt as needed to provide safe, dependable services for the public during winter, but not one pound more. And as, as you guys, especially in the private sector now, a lot of our customers want to see their parking lots white. And we can't keep doing that, guys. I know that's hard for us, but we can't keep doing it. The good thing is we are getting some of these property management companies. Like I mentioned this morning, I know Amazon Primes, some of the Walmarts, uh, in their contracts, they're starting to call for liquid. So we're starting to see that kind of change where in the past we had pushback from everybody, contractor, I mean, customer-wise, because they wanted their parking lots covered with salt because of liability. So what New Hampshire's done with the liability deal has really helped. Um, and we're starting to see kind of some changes in that. There was some changes in Illinois. I don't know to what extent they went, but um, anyway. So now we'll leave the environmental part of this. So you're seeing our electric motor units there. Five times I've put down here for using brine, okay? Number one, pre-treating your files. Number two, DLA, which is, I believe, the most important. Number three is pre-wetting. Number four, slurry. Number five, post-treatment, okay? We're trying to accomplish a coefficients of friction of 1.7 to 2. And since we've been reactive most of the time, ah, why is it doing that? Okay, there we go. Since we've been reactive most of the time, a lot of times we're up closer to the 7 mark. 
because we've allowed hard pack. So, you know, I think the evolution of this for those of us who are snow fighters is when we first started fighting snow, let's say back in the 50s, everything was reactionary, right? We waited until it snowed before we did anything. And back then, you waited until it finished snowing before you did anything. And then as, as we became more sophisticated as a society and everybody had to travel to work, we got where, you know, once you got a few inches of snow, then you were trying to get it off the roads and, and take care of it. Same way in parking lots. You know, when I first started in parking lots, uh, you had customers who didn't want anything until there was four inches of snow. Well, obviously you're gonna have hard pack, right? I mean, the snow's coming down, whatever rate it's coming down, the cars are gonna drive on it, and now you have ice. What we're trying to do with liquid is quit being reactionary and be proactionary. Now, that presents problems on the private side with how do you get paid, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. But you guys understand, kind of see the progression here? We're going from those of us with white hair that were used to all reactionary. I mean, I used to hire a weather forecaster for my company to tell me when is it gonna snow, how much stuff. I mean, I didn't depend on the internet. And back then, you know, there was some internet, not like today, but I still wouldn't. If I was doing it today, I would still hire my weather guy to tell me what the heck's gonna happen. And I'm going to build my plan based on what he said. And like my son's in snow removal, he always going off on the weather guy and how they're always wrong. And it's true, right? I mean, they don't hit it on, on the nail all the time. But you know what? In 20 years of doing it, I was never one time surprised with a snowstorm. Never once. I thought I was once because I woke up at my house and there were six inches of snow and I hadn't heard anything from my weather guy. And I was screaming at him. And he said, no, you come into town, you won't. And literally, my office was on the south side of town. And right at that line, there was no snow. The whole city got missed. My house got six inches. It was well worth having the weather guy to help me create a proactive approach to snow removal. And by doing that, you save 50, 70% of what it costs you to, to be reactive. So I don't, how many of you would consider yourself proactive with snow? You're doing pre-treatment, you're getting good weather forecasts or as good as you can get. Okay, how many of you say, man, I, I just never really thought about it, I've always been reactive. We wait, all of our contracts say we don't do anything until there's two inches of snow, or if you're a <coughs> municipality, they say, well, we don't touch it until there's two inches of snow. How many of you are like that? couple of you will admit it. And truthfully, when I say you'll admit it, a lot of us haven't known any different, right? So there's no pointing the finger here. They just, people didn't know that we could be proactive instead of reactive. So if you have a t trigger depth in your contract, guys, you're going to have ice. If you're trigger depth, I used to work for a guy who wouldn't let me use the word trigger because it was like a gun. You guys, if you ever see a race, they always use a trigger pull to start a race. So, I guess, yeah, a question I would have. How many of you start, as soon as there's snow, you're engaged because your contracts or your city or whatever allows you to engage from the very first flake of snow? How many of you are waiting until there's an inch of snow before you go out? Quite a few more. It's kind of ironic. I think it depends on the forecast. We treat, but yet we don't plow residentially until two inches. Right. So, yeah. He, he was just saying, you know, it's kind of silly, ironic, because we go out and pre treat, but then on the residential stuff, we can't go out and do anything until there's two inches of snow. So I'm telling you guys, if, you, if your trigger depth is an inch or, or more, you're going to have hard pack. You're gonna to have to figure out how to deal with it. I know one of my guys who used to be one of my subs, he's now one of my biggest dealers and he still does some contracting work. 
super proactive. He, he said that, uh, first of all, he puts down enough brine that it'll take care of the first half inch of snow, period. But he's not using it for that. He's using it so that if he puts it down and there's no bond between the snow and the pavement, which is the real reason for liquids. But he's melting a half inch, so he's built buying himself time. But he's moved all of his contracts from any limit to starting as soon as the snow starts so that we could be proactive, which saves us money, saves the environment, and saves our equipment. So we've done both in Milwaukee. Have you? Yeah. And what do you find? What we found is that it's almost impossible for us to keep enough drivers to be able to do our residential sure. and do it efficiently. But when we do do it, yeah, we probably don't actually have to drop dry salt until we hit the range mark. Okay. Um, and that's on obviously grass. Sure. But we've seen that we'll usually uh, prep the arterials, our main streets, and then if we have enough time and it doesn't look like the storm is going to come in wet, then we will then hit the residentials. Yeah. We can do the whole city in roughly two eight-hour shifts. There you go. So, yeah, that, I mean, labor is a big issue, right? And so this guy I'm talking about, this contractor, what he's doing too, is you get more than a half inch of snow, let's say you get an inch of snow, an inch of snow is hard to plow, you can plow, but it's hard. He actually goes out and treats it with another round of liquid because he's putting down so much <laughs> less product because if he was gonna plow it, he'd have to treat it after that anyway. So he just hits it with another half or, or another round of liquid. Um, this is also an area where what I've mentioned about the longevity of salt brine versus mag or calcium. In your residential areas, think about this. What if you put down brine, straight brine, on your residential areas because it's gonna take you hours if not days to get to those anyway and you let the brine do the work. And who cares that it's not done in three hours like you want on your main arterials this is just in the residentials where sometimes you plow, sometimes you don't, depending on the cities. But that'd be a great place to put down brine, even though it's taken longer, much longer to work at those cold, cold temperatures. It's just a thought. I won't make any predictions there, but if any of you do it, I'd love to know what your results are. So we're going to talk anti-icing here for a minute. How many of you are, are pre-treating? Yep. Okay. Uh, all of a sudden you get this free little snowbird comes up. It's not planted. Yep. Then you get, it drops two or three inches of snow right away. What do you go on residential? What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I'll say in the 20 years I had a company doing that, I never, ever had a storm come through that I didn't know was going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't get some... On a Sunday in 1999, I was in church, clear outside. No one was calling for any weather. I get to my truck and I realize my weather guy had left me a message. And I called him back. He said, a little low pressure has developed in Omaha. It's coming right down I-29. It will be here in three hours. And so the temperature was in the 40s, along with this low pressure was moisture and the temperature dropping to about 25 degrees within about 15 minutes. The wind was blowing about 70 miles an hour. That was the scariest forecast I could ever imagine. How do you mobilize your whole network? You know, I had a thousand acres. How do you mobilize getting that taken care of in three hours? Well, what I did is I sat in my truck and I called my tree of numbers who called their tree of numbers and literally we finished uh, doing a pre-treatment about 20 minutes before the storm started. That storm started, the DOT didn't get that message. There was a 30 car pile up just on the north side of the city which called, uh, killed one of our star football players. 
So part of this deal, guys, is the whole thing. I, I would never allow myself to not know something was happening. Um, and I don't trust myself on the internet. I'm not a meteorologist. I hired one because I wanted to know what the heck was going to happen. So just a thought. Do you have yeah, something? Just throwing out there in terms of weather, how many of the satellites are going to tap into orbit? The It's definitely worth having, guys. Okay. Use it. That's, that's really good information. So guys, it's impossible to be proactive if we don't know what's going to happen, right? So in some of the country, what I'm seeing now is especially on the DOT side, but this would also could be true for any entity. A matter of fact, the friend I was just talking about, he's starting to do this. On a Friday afternoon, he's actually putting it into the schedule that his guys, when they're not on overtime, are going out and hitting their lots and stuff with Brian. And you say, well, you say, well, you know, that doesn't make sense because there's not a storm coming in. You could brine your parking lot 10 times and not have as much salt down as you do when you put one load of rock salt down. So there's other another real advantage to doing that. One of the things in part of the country you guys probably are getting this a little more than you used to, is the storm starts rain. And so guys say, well, I'm not gonna brine if it's raining because it just all gets washed away. It's not true. Actually, what some guys from Ohio taught me, this was after I had been a contractor, I wish I'd have known it back then, was they go out seven times before the season even starts, seven times before the first snowfall and put down a pre-treatment. And what that does is it gets enough of it built up in the surface that it doesn't wash away. And so they're getting advantage and then they pre-treat every storm. So some people, you know, this is where I really do disagree with some of the clear road stuff and some of the other uh, things going on. And it's okay to disagree guys, by the way. But um, they'll say, don't put it down before a freezing rain. Don't put it down before a rainstorm. If you do what I just said, in both those situations, you're still going to get the benefit of having a pre-treatment down. I've got a, okay, so one of your, um, I think you had it up here before about when to apply this stuff. That's the same, that's the same thing I'm using. It says do not put it on right. when it's raining. Now you're right. telling us too. So Here's the thing about that, and then, again, I'll go back to a couple contractors that I work with. When you put it down right before the rainstorm, you're going to lose it. It's going away. If you put it down in time that it dries, it's not going to wash away. Now, again, that depends on how much of it's down there. So you get a two-day rainstorm, and most of it's going to wash away. I mean, last winter, we had some storms that produced four inches of rain uh, before it snowed. How much of it's going to be there, I can't tell. But you're, you're, losing very, you're losing very little product compared, and the same way with the freezing rain. People say, well, we're not going to put it down with the freezing rain. Let's talk about it logically for a second. What's a freezing rain? Warm air temperatures, cold pavement temperatures, right? So what's your pavement temperature going to be like? It's going to be fairly warm. It's just below freezing. So when, when rain falls on a frozen surface, it freezes. But if you've got brine there, it drops up, it lowers that point. Now, people will say, well, but then it dilutes out. There's a possibility that it will. So let me ask you this. Would you rather put it down um, 
with the possibility of it diluting out or not do it at all. In a freezing rain, I can tell you, I've salted the parking lot sometimes 10 to 11 times to get that ice up. I don't care if I lose a pretreatment, I don't care compared to putting 10 rounds of salt down to get that out of there. And when you do that, you're salting that ice, it's turning to slush, you're pushing it off, and all that salt's just going right up into the turf or into the drain, right? So I, you know, as one from a practical situation, that's my, we'll say theology, but I, I'll get pushback from a lot of these agencies on it. And I say mostly it's because they don't have enough brine down and they haven't let it get down early enough to dry. If it's wet, yes, it's going to wash it all away. But if it's dried, that means some of that brine's gone down into the surface. And, you know, it's like pre treating any time. When you pre treat with brine versus rock salt, you pre treat with rock salt, and then let's say an inch later you're out there pushing it, where's all that salt going? And your snow pops, right? Really, all of them. When you put down brine and you go out and push snow, where's all that salt going? It's not because it's in the pavement. Okay, so there's very little in that snow. So, I, I mean, I'm, this is why I'm kind of rabid about brine, you guys, is because I've done it the other way. I did it the other way for years until I started getting familiar with what liquids would do for me. And, uh, and even then, back then, all these manufacturers were nothing but liars. I hate to say it. I could name the names. You guys all know the names. Because they all said brine doesn't work. And they were up to here full of it. They had to say that. Because I was paying $2.50 a gallon for their material. I could make brine for $0.08 cents a gallon. Do you think I'd ever pay two fifty a gallon if I'd have known that brine would work? Not on your life. So I, I think there's reasons we've all been miscommunicated with on some of this, especially from the manufacturers. Does that mean there's no time for blending? No, that's not to say that at all. There's some really good blending products out there today. But they have all kind of had to acknowledge that the base of any good blended product is brine. You're going to be putting at least... 80% brine down with some kind of a blend if you decide to use a blend. You could go as much as 70, 30, but you gotta watch out if you start getting it that high of an exothermic chemical. So, questions on all that rant that I just went on? This is all anti-icing stuff. You guys have seen this stuff. So I'll just give you this quote because I, I thought this quote was very good. Anti-icing is the most environmentally safe, cost-effective practice in winter maintenance. It requires one-fourth of the material and one-tenth of the overall de-icing. I, I tend to think it says one-quarter of the material. I'll say a lot of people now are even putting down less than that. De-icing. Again, this is something I never really want to do, but I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, anybody in here familiar with Brian from uh, the Detroit area? Yeah. The guy's been doing brining stuff for a long, long time. These pictures all come from them. So in this situation, they didn't pre-treat any of these pictures I'm going to show you. This is all post-treated. So somebody raise your hand. Tell me, or you don't have to raise your hand, just tell me. Which side, they, they did them differently. Which side looks like it's the best? Again, this is post-treating, after they plowed it. I'm sorry? The left looks the best? Anybody else got an opinion on that? Either one? <laughs> yeah, really what I hear as a whole is they look about the same, right? Um, so let me show you what actually they did to accomplish that. On this side, they used rock salt. 
On that side, they used liquid. Brine. Difference is they used 350 pounds of salt on the left side, $12.5 per lane mile. On the right side, they used 138 pounds of salt, $4.83 per lane mile. So let me ask you a question. Why in the world would you do what they did on the left side if you get the same result by doing what they did on the right side? Why would you do that? That was your picture, right? Why did you do that? I'll tell you why they did it. Is because they didn't know any better. That's why everybody's doing it. They don't know any better. They don't know that you can accomplish the same thing with liquid that you can accomplish with granular at way less than half the price. Here's another one. So they, they sprayed this on. You got pavement temperatures of 28 degrees, 55 gallons per lane mile. That's what it looked like the next morning. No plowing. That's all post-treating with just liquid. There's a difference in your cost. I like this one. It's pretty clear. That's what it looked like 25 minutes after the application with just liquid. There's a difference in your cost. $2.48 versus $17.50. I really like this one. Why? It's 11 degrees, so we're kind of below that threshold of efficient, right, or effective. Why is this not melting? Shade. Shade. Can I take you one step deeper? It is because of shade, but it's really not the shade. It's the pavement temperature. The pavement temperature is colder because of the shade, but if there was a culvert right there or, you know, whatever that's causing that pavement not to warm up, that's why you've got this. Again, this was 11 degrees. Now they used a blend on that. Effective and efficient. So you can see how much deeper a treated liquid treated kernel of salt is going than a plain kernel of salt. Let's talk efficiencies. One truckload of salt will produce about four truckloads of brine. Each truckload of brine will cover as much territory as one truckload of salt, or uh, four truckloads of salt. So it's way, way more efficient. Another way to show that, the red is how far you go at 300 pounds per lane mile with dry salt. The blue is how far you go at 20 gallons per lane mile with liquid. 67 versus 435 miles. <laughs> So, two primary things that I feel like, again, this is me, are hugely important with brine. How much more time do I have? As long as you guys are sitting here, I can, I'll keep talking, but I don't mean to, I don't want to hold you way over here. Um, these are the two, I feel like, most important things that are going to determine how much brine. What's your pavement temperature? Because like all melting agents, the colder it gets, the less effective it is, okay? So one of the keys, if you're, if you're a uh, contractor in here and you want to go all liquid, which is pretty unusual, got to be kind of ballsy to do that, but let me tell you, that's what's happening. What, one of the ways you guys are doing it is they're putting bulk storage tanks out on their key properties and as soon as they remove the snow, they're on that property putting liquid on it. I mean, used to be, we always ran salt routes, and sometimes it'd be 
three to four hours after it was plowed before we got the salt down. Well, as soon as you remove the salt, what happens to the pavement temperature? Right? Going down fast. So if you come in here and you put liquid on it as soon as possible, you're gonna effectively work on the pavement at its warmest point. So those of you in public works, it's a little easier because you're not going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So you can kind of spray it as you plow. Um, for contractors, it's harder because you'll kill your transmission if you run a loaded tank and you're plowing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So you put a bulk tank on there. One, one of my friends that has been very successful at this in Detroit, he put bulk tanks around on all of his properties and then every one of his plow trucks had a 300 gallon sprayer in it. And as soon as they plowed that property, they hooked up, filled their sprayers and sprayed the property. And so your pavement temperature is still fairly warm. So you're at the most effective point for your brine to work well. And he was doing it without any blends. And in Chicago, that could be, I mean, in uh, Detroit, that could be a little tough. He struggled the first two years, but he kind of got it down and then it just has done really well with it. Um, so I'm not getting any pushback from you guys, but sometimes there's pushback about temperatures. I can tell you there's no reason to avoid it because, I mean, we're using liquids in Alaska, we're using it in North Alaska, in Fairbanks, we're using Anchorage, I mean, DOT, Alaska DOT uses it. There's no reason for temperature to be an obstacle. There's ways to overcome the temperatures. It never gets too cold for brine. Um, it may not work the way that you want it to work, but obviously it gets colder than rock salt can do in a lot of part of the country. So how you taking care of it, a lot of people don't even treat it when it gets that cold, but anyway. Yeah, one, one thing. Yep. Sure. I think that you, you mentioned it, but I didn't, I didn't register it. Okay. Uh, how cold are putting brine down on the slip is said? Are you saying put it down at any temperature? Okay, so I'm gonna be I'm a little controversial in this statement, but if I was doing if I was a snow fighter again, which I probably will never be, I'm too old for that now. Um, I would use nothing but liquid, and yet you can't use straight salt brine in this market year round. I mean all year. Now. One of my biggest markets right now is in Texas, Oklahoma. They don't need any any blends. They can run straight salt brine all the time. My Kansas City market, we're probably one storm a year needing a blend. Up here, I'm gonna say 50% of your storms are probably gonna require a blend. Anything where the pavement temperature is getting below 15 degrees, I'm gonna run a blend. I believe Again, I believe, I'm not here doing it, so take that as a grain of salt. I believe here, like anywhere else, you can do 100% liquid. It's just that you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to be open to change. But it's like, it's like, how many of you guys have a degree from a university on salting a property? Well, then why are you out doing it? Nobody knows anything. <laughs> I mean, the way I learned to salt was a guy said, do you know how to drive a truck? And I said, hey, I grew up on a farm. If it has wheels, I could drive it. That was pretty arrogant, to be honest, but it's what I said. He sent me out salting. I put six acres on one, one acre lot because I salted it. I didn't see anything happen. I salted it again. I didn't see anything happen. By the time I dumped six tons on that one acre, it was running off like Niagara Falls. My point is, we learn by doing it, okay? There's a lot of good seminars now on liquids. You're gonna learn a lot from just listening to people, but there's no shortcut to some experience. You're gonna get out, you're gonna try it, and you're possibly even gonna fail at it. One failure is gonna change what you do, though, right? So, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll repeat then. So I want to answer it all. I'm just curious um, with the public too is, okay, we'll put this brine, like we, we mix ours, 350 gallons of brine, 50 gallons of water. Okay. So 
because it's below 15. People see this. Like, what the hell are you doing? Because they freeze. Okay. So are we making a bigger mess? Well, so here's one of the super important things is your brine needs to be, I hate to harp on it, 23.3. It needs to be 23.3%. I'm going to see if I have this slide in here um, that's really important. So you can see from this slide that brine is the most effective at 23.3%. Okay? So let's say. Let's say you made a mistake, and Kevin, you and I have been out to a lot of customers where we check the brine in their tanks, right? And almost none of them were right. So here's the issue with being right. If your brine is at 25%, where is it going to freeze? Up here at about 15 degrees. If you're one of those who said, Kevin and I called on Utah DOT one day and they said they make their brine at 26.5%. I couldn't argue with them because they didn't want to argue about it. They didn't even want logic. But if you make your brine at 26%, run that line straight up and see where it's freezing. 28 degrees? A lot of people think that the hotter the brine, the better it is on the road. And I think all of you, there's some in this crowd that don't know the difference that too hot is not good. Too hot is really bad. Too not up to 23.3 is much better than it being over 23.3. So that's why it's it's super important to test your brine. Get a little refractometer. Um, do you guys sell those? Okay. So get a little refractometer. It's an expensive little tool, but when you when you put brine in a tank, you test that brine and make sure it's 23.3. If your brine is over 23.3, run it back to your brine maker and get it up to 23.3. If it's too low, depending on how low it is, you may want to run it back to your brine maker too. Yeah, Kevin. Also, touch base on anything. A lot of times we get out to local sites where the tanks are, and anybody that's making brine that's hotter than 26, it will come out of suspension, and you'll have actual salt in the bottom of your tank. So if you guys at all your locations here are seeing other than foreign debris, you know, the dust, the dirt, the, the, uh, the flowers from the gypsum, that type of stuff, if it's truly salt, I would question what your brine is being made. It will not fall out of So that's something to think about if you do have actual salt in your hopper excuse me, in your storage tank where your liquid's being stored. So there's, right, Kevin, there's two reasons to have it at 23.3. Number one, that's all the salt that water will hold. After it hits 23.3, the salt settles out of there. So people ask me almost every day, do I need to recirculate my brine? And the answer is, if you made your brine right, you don't need to recirculate it ever. That's why we're trying to get it out of lakes and rivers, because it does not go away, ever. So that's one reason. The second reason is that you take the temperature point at 23.3, your brine is good to minus six degrees. Now, the other thing that starts playing into this is dilution. This is where the science and the art come in. How do we know what the pavement temperature is? Somebody tell me. Right, you read it off a little gun, or you read it off, you get one for your mirror. That's what I suggest, one on the mirror, it's more accurate, tells you what the pavement temperature is. How do you know how diluted it is once you put it down? I mean, you know it's 23.3 when you put it down, but once it hits the pavement and you start getting some snow on there, how diluted is it? How do you know? There is no way to know. That's the art, guys. I mean, my daughter, my daughter is a ballet dancer. She didn't get to do shows and stuff just because she's a good dancer. She got to be a good dancer because she practices all the time. The only way you're going to know if it's diluted out too much is by doing it and watching it. So at a 50% dilution, this tells you calcium chloride freezes at 10 degrees. The eutectic is minus 60, but at 
50% dilution, it freezes at 10. Mag chloride freezes at 15. Salt freezes at 18 at a 50% dilution. How do we know how far diluted it is? Unfortunately, there is no device out there that can tell us. Kim. So one more thing on when you guys are doing your testing, how many of you have just a hands up and use the actual beaker to test you? 80% of you, 70% of you? The hydrometer. The hydrometers, all right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about? <coughs> Remember, when you do your testing to check for what your percentage rate of your brine is, there is a chart you have to go off of for what your temperature of your liquids are. If you're not using the chart to calibrate that, your brine is not being made at the right time. So that's another it's important thought for you guys to think yep. about. So here, just to give you an example how there's different opinions, guys. APWA has a suggested amount. Salt Institute, SaltWise. Everybody has a little bit different application rate. You're going to have to figure out what works best in your market. But I just wanted to show how that, that there's opinion in this stuff, too, because it is partly science. So here's my suggestion. I'm not your consultant. If you pay me as a consultant, maybe I would be, except I don't do that. But I'm gonna say 18 to 35 gallons per acre or per lane mile for pre-treating. Now, what I have found is when I'm in Texas, they're more like 18 gallons per lane mile. When I move up to I-70, we're more like 30, 32 gallons per lane mile. When I move up to I-80, that changes to 40 to 45. When I move up here, I'm finding 50 gallons per lane for pre-treat. So you can see the colder the temperature, the more we're putting down to get the results we're looking for. But I'm gonna say, as a general rule, I say start at 30 and then adjust it. If you don't need 30 where you are for whatever reason, don't put 30 down. If you need 50, then make sure you're putting 50 down. But 30 is a good place to start to see where you need to be. And part of that also is determined by what's your goal. What are you trying to accomplish? You know, are you trying to just keep the bond from forming or are you actually trying to melt snow and ice? So just quickly here and then we'll get into the conversation about contracts. Anti-ice pre-treating DLA at 25 gallons per lane mile, you can do 35 miles out of one ton of salt. Anybody getting that out of your rock salt, 35 miles? Brine's way more efficient. Post treating at 60 gallons, which may be what you're pre treating, 14 and a half mi miles out of one ton of salt. Uh, pre wet, pre-treated and dry salt. This says four miles out of dry salt. Truthfully, most people aren't getting that much. You may say, well, we're putting it down at 150 per pass, but you're doing five passes, which means you're actually at about seven to 800 pounds per event. Does that make sense? I think I've got one here where I attach dollars to it. So, 23.3% brine, say if you're doing 350 pounds per acre or lane mile, you're saving $9.05 and 207 pounds of salt per lane mile per application. And if you do three applications in one storm, you can see how much money you're saving. I have a little calculator where we can actually take your numbers and put it into it and actually come up with savings as well as you could do that and put equipment costs in there and see what your real return on investment is and up here i'm telling you guys i'll bet i i'll bet if you give me your numbers and i did that for you there's not one entity in here who wouldn't pay for all the equipment you need in one year that's how much money you save okay So that's, that's where I go to the calculator. But I, instead of going to the calculator and doing that, what I want to do is go to this thing, which is the biggest question I get, which is what you guys were told this whole thing was going to be about. I just felt like I needed to lay out this foundation before I got to this. 
how do I get my customers to buy into this? So, and, and you know what, that's mostly a contractor issue, but for some of you working for cities, you got the same issue with your um, city manager, or whoever, you got to prove or come up with some reason why this is going to work. So, I'm going to ask this to be pretty interactive, but I'll make a few statements to get us started. So what I did in my world is I changed the verbiage in my contract. So originally my contracts had the term anti-icing, de-icing, and used the term salt. So every time we salted a lot, it was for a certain amount of money. Okay? So we, we charge on a per application basis. So what I did is I went into my contracts, I took the word salt out. That way, if I was using any chemical, they could never come back and say, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Um, next thing I did is I took out the word de-ice because what I never want to do is de-ice. I want to anti-ice. And again, that can be before, during, or after the event. So I took those two things out. Now here's kind of the hard part. I see basically three types of contracts. You could say four, and one of them comes with some caveats. So how many of you in here charge on a seasonal basis? Okay. How many of you do T and M? Okay. How many of you do per application? Okay. Well, good. I, I, I mean, this is pretty good. So some of you got a mix of all of those. Some of you are doing per application. Uh, a couple of you are doing TNM. So on your TNM is one of the harder ones to figure out. Uh, <coughs> so what I suggest on that, guys, is don't change anything from what you're doing. You just charge whatever you're charging for salt. Um, I hate to see guys going to charging per gallon because the more efficient you get, the less money you make. So don't don't charge per gallon. Figure out, I mean, most of the time what I found on TNM, guys figure, well, I put down four ton every time on this property. And even if I don't, that's what I'm charging for. Four tons, right? So it's not really a true TNM. Customer doesn't know that. I suggest doing the same thing on the brine. What's what are you charging them for four tons of salt? Charge them the exact same thing for for the brine that you're using, and your costs are going to be about ninety percent less. I would recommend going away from T and M. I would too. Um, when I found that T and M was my lowest profit margin, yep. and it paid, it didn't incentivize anybody to be efficient and do it faster. And they cheat. And they cheat, and, it's, and, it's, and it was my biggest headache for customers not paying their bill. Yeah, they would have. I would have to prove that I was there, yeah. and it was such a hassle. My lowest margin, my biggest headache. Yeah, I, I would agree. If you can get away from TNM, do it. But I only saw one or two of you that's doing exclusively TNM. Um, but I really, I I despise that method just because the I always am about efficiencies. And you're, the more efficient you get, the less money you make. Okay, so let's jump to the seasonal. Hey, go ahead. I have a question for that. Yep. So what if you have a contract that says, hey, you have a condo complex that is dead set on just saying, hey, if you want to do a seasonal contract, we're not paying for something that we're not getting. You know, that's a close of, of salt and, mm -hmm. and snow and this and that. Get that understand. We're only doing 10 minutes. Okay, we only want to pay for what we're doing and only pay for what we warranted for free. Are they calling the shots on when you come out? So they try to, and I put a kibosh for that. So okay. I want to make sure that yep. you know, we're coming up based on the contract. You're not going to call me at 8 a.m. and yeah. you know, get my crew. Sorry, buddy, my trucks are already at home. Yeah, we've yeah. been already asleep, right? We've yeah. out all night. So right. I, I put the kibosh for that. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, based on that, what, what would you do? I would, <coughs> let me ask you a question. So when you salted, do you charge them the same price every time, or yeah. do you, you do? Okay. Yeah. So what I would do is exactly the same thing and just use liquid. Okay. 
I wouldn't change anything. And so then one of the questions becomes, well, how do I let my customer know what I'm doing? This is one of my pet peeves. Guys, you are the experts. They are not the experts. They don't know squat about taking care of snow removal. They know how to look at numbers and see if you know it's costing them too much, all that stuff. They don't know. I'm gonna encourage you, be the professional. Okay. So first thing I would say, and this is not a, it is a promotion actually. I was the president of SIMA, I believe in SIMA. If you're a contractor and you're not a member of SIMA, shame on you. Get, get to be a member. Learn how professionals think about snow and ice. And when you sit down in front of that customer, I guarantee you the customers I had, they, they thought of me as the professional because I was. I knew way more about it than they knew. I went into Arrowhead Stadium to sell the cheese. I walked out with a contract that paid me, I only did it once a year at that, maybe once every other year. That contract paid me $150,000 every time I did it. Why'd they hire me? Because I knew what the heck I was talking about. And they knew I knew what I was talking about. And over the 17 years I did that stadium, we never one time didn't have that stadium open at seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. The guys I sold my company to still had that contract. And really, I'm telling you, it was because we knew what the heck we were talking about. And we are the professionals. And I encourage you guys, don't let, I know, I, I do get it, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Don't let your customer pull you around by the short hairs. You're, you're the guys who know what the heck you're talking about. And if you don't, learn it. And have that have that aura about you. You know, I'm not saying being rude to customers. We never want to do that. But um, I hope that made that case of what I was saying. So well, did, did, did that uh, yeah. answer your question? Absolutely. And, okay. You know, I, I completely agree with you. Okay. With what you're saying. Not okay. from the, the tail wagging the dog, right? Yeah. I was supporting it 110 percent because we have a sales rep. She's she's very knowledgeable. She's a pain in the ass. <laughs> and though your good sellers are pain in the ass, but she tells the customer what they need, and she sells about 130 percent to her contract, and then in enhancements. Wow. Yeah, huge dollars. But then we have another one that's not like that. She's selling. He is selling probably 40 percent. Yeah. So she's very strong. She's a pain in the ass, but she tells the customer, "Hey, I'm a professional. I'm going to tell you what you need. Yep. And you're going to accept it." Yep. That's what it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, and she sells, like I said. She does, she does, she's a number one seller. Even in one, too. Yeah. She sells amazing. 150% enhancements on contracts. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It is. And, and I mean, when I first started my company, I, I was going out and selling anywhere from 200 to 500 acres. No, never 500, I guess. 200 to 300 acres of contracts per year. And I was doing that because guys knew when they talked to me, that I knew what I was talking about, plus there was one additional thing. And I had this a bunch of times. The guy sitting across the table from me said, man, I have never seen someone excited about snow removal. I was passionate about it. I mean, and one reason why was because back then we used to actually make money at it. <laughs> the money's a little less right now, which is a great thing about Brian, and it gives us a chance to come back in and make some more money. But, um, so that's no number one on the TNS. On your per occurrence, um, that one's probably the easiest of all. You know, again, I wouldn't necessarily tell, tell the customer how I'm gonna do it. I'm the professional, I'm gonna do it, and you're gonna pay the bill. And you're gonna go out there and you're gonna pre-treat with liquids, and if you do, you think, well, I can't afford to always be out there pre-treating. You're gonna save so much on the backside, you guys, that it's gonna make it worth it every time. I mean, if you take the whole year as a whole, for sure. Maybe not every single storm, but if you take the whole year as a whole. So then, that takes us to seasonals. Seasonals, in some ways, is the easiest. Because usually in a seasonal, you're 100% responsible for everything, everything. Right? So they don't argue too much with you figuring out how you're going to do it. So again, with these seasonals, I'll tell you me, I'd be out there pre-treating before the first snowfall five to seven times to make sure I had plenty of it right at the surface. And then I pre-treat every storm and 
I can't tell you how many people, maybe it was Jefferson County, I can't remember who said, but what somebody said to me pretty recently, when I became successful using liquids is when I quit trying to think about whether to use liquids. In other words, some people do it one storm and don't do it the next storm, and oh, this isn't an appropriate storm, and da 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 da. When you stop thinking that way, you're going to become successful. Now, one downside to liquids could be wind. I've heard that and heard that and heard that and heard that. And truthfully, I can't argue it, but I'd like to. I was out in Wyoming, and they're going, well, we don't use any liquids out here because because of the wind. And I said, well, okay, what's that mean? And, well, it sticks to the road instead of blowing on over the road. So here's what I'm going to assume. They were using a blend for pre-treating, which means down to zero degrees, it's melting snow and ice. Well, quit using the blend and use straight brine. You know, below 15 degrees, it's going to work so slowly that the, the snow is just going to blow on across. If you put it down in time that it dries, the snow is just going to blow across the road until your pavement temperatures come up enough that it will start working. So I kind of am a believer in pre-treating with straight brine most of the time, if not all the time, and using a blend you know, for post-treating, which would be during and after the event. Once there's moisture on the ground, using the post-treating post -treat, post with a blend, but before the storm, pre-treating with straight brine. And the temperature then, you know, I mean, okay, let me ask you a question. Does wind chill cause your road to freeze or your parking lot? Right, we, we all know that, right? Although you can't believe how many, I say we all, a lot yeah, of people. Cool, but it's real cool, yeah. yeah. The, here's what the wind does. It affects it, yes. It takes the heat out of it quickly, but it never is going to be colder than the air temperature or the ground temperature, one of the two, or it's going to regulate the surface temperature. And so the wind isn't an issue as far as it melting. It's just, again, what people tend to do is be reactionary. That They see the storm coming in, and they go out and put the brine in. Well, the brine's still wet, so it is going to draw snow. It's going to stick to it. But if you go out there the day before and you put it down, now it's going to be dry and it's going to blow across the road. I think that's my opinion. I, I've never been in those. I mean, we have a lot of wind where I'm at. We always use the liquid, but um, it'd be interesting to get feedback from some of you as I go. So, yeah. We, we try that. And it, it failed on us miserably a couple of times. Um, Where it froze? No, it would, we went out a couple days before the storm and we normally pre-treat uh, bridge decks, our ramps on our freeway interstate and then yep. some problem areas. Yep. Um, a couple days later, on a Saturday, let's say Saturday morning, it snowed like an inch. Mm -hmm. It was real windy. The only place that I had snow was my bridge decks, my ramps and my problem areas. What were you using for material? Straight. Salt Straight brine. brine. Yeah. Okay. So it's, I I think it attracts that snow because once it hits it, it starts melting. There, there's no other explanation that I can think of that. Yeah. That can explain that. No, that's fair yeah. enough, and I can't argue that because I personally haven't done it. Logically, I can talk it away, but I also can see that that could be the issue. Um, I still can say the guys that I know that are successful with brine do it all the time, period. And they'll they'll fight to death over that. But I've never personally done it. So I can't tell you. One, one thing, you just brought up something though, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about in one sense, but I want to bring it up. How many of you are familiar with Cryotech? Cryotech's a manufacturer out of Iowa that built an airport material. And this material costs, depending on how much of it you buy, but it's up about $10 a gallon. I think it's going to be more now because of the supply chain. Thing. $10 a gallon. But it has zero chlorides in it. So that's why they could use it in the airport. If any of you guys, is, I think most of the city guys have left, but one of the things I've been pretty passionate about is there is a manufacturer in Denver, and they don't have the blessing of the FCC because Cryotech has some great, um, um, what am I looking for? Lobbyists. 
lobbyists, yeah. But the product is approved as a non-chloride airport product, but they can't sell it as brine. They have to sell it as a pellet. And what I keep envisioning, I've talked to Albuquerque, uh, Dallas, I think. Some of these, you go into some of these southern cities, especially they're just huge networks of bridges. Why in the world would we spend $200 million for a bridge when you could spend, say, $100,000 uh, over its lifetime to de-ice it with a non-chloride product? The, the product that I'm talking about out of Denver has the same, same temperature characteristics as salt because it is a sodium, but it's not chloride. Is that no, entry is a different product. It's a good product. It's super Test expensive. Important. Pardon me? Test uh, yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. She won't tell me what the blend is. I just know it's kind of a sodium product, but it has no chloride in it. It's approved for the airports. And if we could start putting that on the municipality bridge decks, we would stop corroding our bridge decks. Which, you know, I mean, I don't know what it costs to build a bridge these days. It depends on where it is, but $100 million is probably not out of the question. So that's not available to the public in any? Yes. So yeah, I could, you, could, uh, oh, yeah. you could get a hold of me and I can, I can um, help you find it. Um, but it is mostly, it was built for airports, but I see it from the I guess in Helipads, and that's Hel it, Helipads is perfect, yeah. So anyway, that's kind of a side note.